It's Friday night in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and the New York Police Department is out in full force, for good reason. Brownsville is one of New York's bloodiest neighborhoods. Gunshots ring out almost nightly. The neighborhood led the city in murders in 2008 and has one of the highest violent crime rates every year. In the first six months of this year, shootings are up 40%. What do people think when they think of Brownsville? I'm Ray Rivera, a reporter for the New York Times. Night after night you see them, a small army of police officers. They walk the streets, patrol the lobbies, and roam the hallways of the many public housing buildings here. For many of the officers, this is their first assignment out of the academy. And one of their key crime-fighting tools is a controversial strategy known as stop, question, and frisk. The tactic allows police to stop people they reasonably suspect have committed a crime or are about to. And whether the people stopped have done something wrong or not, their name is entered in an ever-growing database. Police say the stops and the data gathered from them are powerful tools in the fight against crime. But the encounters can often be brusque and intrusive, and even many of the people who welcome a strong police presence here wonder how many of these stops are warranted. The whole community is in the uproar because of what's happening. They may have somebody at a stop sign and not have their seatbelt on. They get them out of the car, they're in their pants looking like, what are you in their pants for? Like, what's that about? Each year across New York City, the police make about seven stops for every 100 residents. But within this predominantly black, eight-block section of Brownsville, data shows that the police make about 93 stops for every 100 residents, a frequency unmatched anywhere else in the city. I'm sure they have some reason to be aggressive for us to check certain individuals, but that the, the whole neighborhood don't fall under that guideline. Police officials turned down our offer of an on-camera interview. Oh, Al Baker, New York Times. Yeah, how you doing? Good. But 73rd Precinct Commander Samuel Wright seen here patrolling the streets, said stop and frisk has had a major impact here, helping to reduce homicides and robberies. Yeah. All right, sir, I'm All on right. my way. But measuring that impact is difficult. From 2005 through 2009, violent crime in the city fell nearly 20 percent. Here in the 73rd Precinct, it fell 1.5 percent. Of some half million stops in the city each year, about 6 percent lead to an arrest. Here in this eight-block area, it's less than 1 percent. To many residents here, that prompts this question. Are police using enough discretion before stopping someone? A lot of times for the more uh, petty offenses, like throwing a cigarette on the sidewalk or spitting, um, we might just use that to do the warrant check and then show discretion afterwards if, the, if uh, everything checks out to be okay. I went to visit my cousin in another housing project, and um, he came down, and me and him was talking. Cops pull up and they asked him, do, asked me, do I live here, do you live here? I told him, no, I don't live here. I'm visiting him, he lives here. So he asked for ID, we was in the ID. The cops went back to the car and wrote out a ticket. So he went to hand me the ticket and I asked him what was the ticket for? He said, trespass, and I said, well, I haven't even been in the building yet. And plus, my cousin lives here. Still gave me the ticket. More than half the encounters here occur inside the projects, often in the lobby as police stop people who enter without a key. When you come in the building, it's normally you might see two or three police standing here waiting for right you to there. come in here. They're right there. But often it's the residents who are the ones getting stopped. That's because so many of the locks on these front doors are broken, making keys useless. We checked the doors in building after building in several different housing projects. The locks were broken in nearly all of them. So now they're going to approach you. Because you didn't use the key. You didn't use the key. Police officials say if officers are using broken locks to promulgate stops, they shouldn't. But still, they said, they have an obligation to protect the many elderly and law-abiding citizens who live in the buildings. It's common sense, you know, I'm not going to stop a woman with groceries uh, that opens the door and enters the building. But if I see somebody wearing gang colors, or uh, if I know they don't live there and I know they have a past criminal history, and they come in the building without, you know, being in the company of someone who lives there, or not being buzzed in, or using a key, I can, I can question them for that. Do we welcome the police? Of course I do. And of course I know 99% of the people in the area do. But they also fear the police because of, uh, you can get stopped at, at any time. This guy right here is the best lifeguard in the city. What's going on, man? Greg Jackson, known by many here as the mayor of Brownsville, is a former neighborhood basketball star who had a stint in the NBA. He now runs the Brownsville Recreation Center, 
where generations of young people have gone to escape the perils of street life. Earl B. Free grew up on this court. Fly Williams, the great Tony Jackson, grew up on this court. Brownsville is an impact zone. An impact zone means that cops would jump out of the van anytime, anywhere, on anybody. There's a group of kids coming from the rec center here. They're getting stopped like they're criminals. So those are the good kids. Those are the kids that's trying to go to school, the kids that's trying to, you know, get a, get a scholarship and do something with themselves. So now they become fearful of the cops or they become resentful of the cops. And that's the problem. Let's go. Let's run some routes. Let's go. According to our analysis, young men 15 to 34 years old who live in the area are likely to be stopped about five times a year. Okay, tell you. That includes the football players at nearby Thomas Jefferson High School, many of whom live in the projects. It's a whole bunch of us walking together, going home for practice. So they suspect we up to something. That's all. Get a good stretch. Get a good stretch. I split them up. Now we sit them all together. It looks kind of crazy. To me, it's nothing. But for a cop drive by, I see 45 kids, black kids, with book bags on my hands up their butt at the practice. That's what bothers them. Hey, yo, throw the football. This, this. Some years ago, Coach Cyrus started letting his players take their helmets home so police wouldn't confuse them with gang members. You haven't had any complaints after that, but it, it works. Yeah. I'm not going to say you got every, everybody in the neighborhood is good. No, everybody in the neighborhood is not good, you know. People do do stupid things, you know, and make it bad for others, you know. But the cop being out here is a good thing. You know, but they out, they supposed to be out here to protect us, but sometimes they are worse as enemies. Sometimes they really are.